Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Elliott, and I'm the president and CEO of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And I would like to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us today for what I hope will be a very interesting and exciting <laughs> program, Statecraft in the 21st Century, Policy Coordination on Traditional and Non-Traditional Security Threats. As many of you know, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy's Forum on Asia-Pacific Security has been organizing meetings and events like this on Northeast Asian security issues for over two decades. So when we began planning today's program with our colleagues from the Japan Society, we envisioned an in-person program like we've had many times before. As we all know, the circumstances related to the current situation in the world meant that we had to change our plans and bring together this prominent group of policy practitioners from US, Japan, China, and the Republic of Korea in a virtual format. And I'm very proud to say we have mastered the format and so I'm looking forward to an outstanding uh, virtual program today. But I think it's very appropriate, you know, given the current global situation, the topic that we're going to discuss today. How can we, uh, from different countries around the world, coordinate policy on traditional and non-traditional threats to our global security? The National Committee on American Foreign Policy and the Japan Society have collaborated on several excellent programs over the past few years. And I'd like to thank Dr. Joshua Walker, President and CEO of the Japan Society in New York, for co-hosting today's program with the National Committee on American Foreign Par Policy. Uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Walker, I'd just like to thank him again for um, the great collaboration with our organization and for agreeing to moderate today's discussion. So thanks again to all those of you who ha are participating today, and I'll now give the floor to Dr. Walker to begin day today's program. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Susan. It's been a pleasure to work with you and your team at the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. As you said, uh, we, we thought we would be in person today, but in some ways we're saying good morning to those of you joining on the same time zone as I am here in New York, and good evening to those of us uh, who are in Asia. And I wanna thank you uh, for doing this. It's amazing to see what we've been able to do. Uh, there couldn't be a more timely topic than to talk about statecraft in the 21st century and the policy coordination on the traditional and non-traditional front. Obviously, when we began uh, coordinating these efforts with the National Committee and Susan's team, uh, the COVID-19 may not have been our top priority, particularly here in New York. Now it is. In some ways, our conversation is more timely than ever. And I'm really excited uh, to introduce you to the to our panelists today, uh, all of whom are good friends in different ways. But before I do that, I want to thank each of you for joining us from wherever you are as viewers. I also want to thank our sponsors and our business and policy program of City and Deloitte, Mizuho, Toyota, and United Airlines, and most importantly, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. So without further ado, let me jump in uh, to introduce you to our panelists for today. Going in the order that we're going to have them speak, uh, we have Ambassador Kanehara uh, from uh, Japan joining us in Tokyo, formerly the Deputy National Security Advisor, now has so many titles it's hard to go through, Senior Advisor of Asia Group, Distinguished Research Fellow at Japan Forum on International Relations. Thank you for joining us. We have Ambassador uh, Oh Jung, a Professor of United Nations Studies and a friend to many of us here in New York when he used to be Ambassador here. We have Ambassador Shi Ziyong, the president of China Institute for International Studies from where he joins us today. Thank you for joining. And not, last but not least, Ambassador Kathleen Stevens, president and CEO of the Korea Economic Institute in America, also the chair of the board of the Korea Society and formerly ambassador to Korea. So there can't be a better uh, group to, to talk from. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of them uh, to give a quick opening remarks. Uh, then I'm gonna draw some threads and some questions based on uh, what they've said. And then I've gotten questions from many of you and I appreciate the viewers for sending in those questions that I'll be uh, doing with the question and answer. So without further ado, let me turn uh, to uh, Ambassador Kanehara there in Tokyo. Uh, number one, uh, Kanehara-san, what's the mood like in Tokyo uh, uh, these days and how do you see uh, kind of the, the, the statecraft in 21st century uh, there in Tokyo? Uh, we lost 700, more than 700. Uh, this number seems small, but the Tokyo is softly locked down and the state emergency declaration is still on here. Uh, but the number is now decreasing. We hope that we can lift this 
uh, lockouts, uh, emergency statements, maybe in this month. That's great. So starting with you, Ambassador Kanahata, can you kind of lay out uh, your thoughts about how the current environment, what we're seeing happening today, how this relates uh, to kind of the bigger picture that we're looking at? Obviously, it's easy to, to focus only on COVID, but as, a, as someone who's literally written a book about brand strategy in Japanese, how do you think about the world today? Yes, thank you very much for having me. Coronavirus brought back the borders. Borders were fading away thanks to the globalization. Before coronavirus, many thought that internet platforms like GAFA, optic fiber deep sea cables, and cyberspace made the notions of borders, even time and distance obsolete. Suddenly the borders are back and shuts and in and out flow of the people, businessmen and tourists across the borders just disappeared. We have to ask one big question here. Is the liberal international order that we earned with lots of efforts and bloodshed in the last century being strengthened or just falling apart? At this moment, the governments are too busy to take care of their own national disasters caused by the pandemic. Medical system is on the verge of collapse. Senior people and other fragile people must be protected by social distancing small and medium-sized industries should be helped financially. Even big ones are going to bankrupt. Financial markets, stock markets could be jeopardized if this crisis continues in the long term. Massive financial efforts are necessary. It will leave the astronomic national debts in the future. The world needs effective vaccination before the herd immunity becomes effective. Otherwise, the opening of the economy could be at the risk of the second big wave of propagation of the virus. Humans survived many disasters, calamities. The sense of one world is real in the 21st century. Japan was helped by many people, including US, Korea, China, outside, people from outside Japan after the big tsunami disaster in 2011, when the way out of national contingency against the pandemic is at sight, the international community must cooperate we have to cooperate with each other. The world needs effective leadership. In a crisis, leaders should stand up. I believe that it is possible. Let me touch upon two things. One, we have to take care of places where running water and soap are not enough, where medical facilities are not enough, and where people cannot afford newly emerging vaccinations. Point two, we have to gather efforts and resources to prevent the next pandemic after this coronavirus from spreading again and killing people again massively. Emergency communications, appearance of virus, coordination of emergency measures like shutting down the borders and locking out the cities, manufacturing new vaccines and distribution of new vaccines to places where they are most needed. We have to get more organized next time. We can prepare for the next time we need leadership. Unfortunately, the tension between the US and China is visibly high. The debate is going on whether the initial reaction of Chinese authority in Wuhan was quick enough. We can learn lessons from any experiences for the future, whether it is good or bad. Objective review could contribute to the prevention of the next pandemic. A more concerning factor is, for me, is the competition of great powers that is between the US and China in the long run. The liberal order is based upon consensus and agreements. When the two superpowers are clashing against each other, the world would become shaky. Japan believed that China would become a major partner. Emperor visits Beijing just after Tiananmen in 1989. Japan was the driving force to put China into WTO. At that time, only Japan stood by China. China's rise is because of industrialization. The industrial revolution spread all over the world at the scale of the globe. It started in the Great Britain that the wave reached China. The result is simple that China takes back its own size. This power shift is real and nobody can stop it. But luckily we are not in 19th century. The rule of jungle is no longer applied. Power shift does not and shall not entail leadership challenge or cruel wars in this nuclear age. China can be great in the liberal international order. China was respected long time in Asia. 
not as a military power, but as a source of morality in Asia. China would be respected as a great partner by cooperation and by abiding by the international rules. Let me touch upon two points here. One is North Korea, nuclear issue. This is three here. They shoot missiles, they have nukes. And China has the great influence in North Korea and we need Chinese help and we have to cooperate to resolve North Korea denuclearization and finally the even unification of the two Koreas. Second is, I have said this sorry, but we regret Chinese unilateral force of in the South China Seas and its expansionist approach. Claiming other countries' territory mine is, you know, one thing, but to use force to change the status quo is against the obligation of the peaceful settlement of the disputes. And claiming the South China Sea that is bigger than the Mediterranean as a whole, it is simply against the international law. We need leadership, but for that purpose, we need a cooperation, and we need the cooperation of the superpowers in particular. That's Mary Marx. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kanahara. You put a lot out there, and I have a lot of areas that I want to ask you, but I want to go to uh, Ambassador O uh, and kind of ask you about uh, what the what the situation in Seoul is like and how uh, this big uh, great power competition and everything that we're seeing plays out, particularly from the perspective of, you know, before this crisis in some ways, we already were beginning to see the breakdown of globalization and the rise of nationalism. Uh, it seems that this pandemic has actually accelerated. What impact does that have on the, uh, the art of diplomacy and how do you see this playing out in the 21st century as seen from Korea? Please. You're on mute, Ambassador Oh, you're on mute, so you should uh, take that off. It wouldn't be a Zoom call without having mute, so. There you go. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, uh, as for the pandemic crisis uh, here in Korea, uh, well, we have been reasonably successful with low numbers of cases and deaths without resorting to a total lockdown. Uh, that is thanks to thorough testing and tracking. But that also means that as we are far from natural herd immunity, we will have to keep up the personnel and resource intensive efforts until the world is safe or there is a vaccine. So after all, I think all of us will have to face the question of how much risk is acceptable when we reopen society. I, I understand that in the United States, you are reopening uh, in most states. Um, we all have to do that. We, have, we all have to bite the bullet, but uh, you know, this is a very hard choice. Um, overall, I think we will eventually get over with the crisis, probably with the medical solution. However, like any other worldwide crisis in the past, this one will leave an impact on our life and society for many years to come. I like to think of short-term and long-term consequences. In the short run, we will suffer from the impact of the crisis on our public health and economy. When it comes to public health, this pandemic is a kind of wake-up call for all of us. Public health has been chronically underfunded because in contrast to medicine, which focuses on treating ill patients, a lot of public health is about dealing with healthy people. Now, we realize that if we don't pay enough attention to public health, not only in our own country, but globally, we will never be safe again. Even after reopening, we will have to continue to tackle the economic impact for quite a while. That will probably aggravate the problems coming from growing inequalities all over the world. Actually, without the pandemic crisis, inequality in wealth was already posing a global challenge as 1% rich population own more than half of total wealth in the world. But from now on, people who can afford will spend more money and resources, protect themselves from this kind of deadly threat, and the industry and the market will respond to those needs. The so-called fourth industrial revolution technologies have become more important due to this crisis, such as e-medicine or surveillance tax. 
who is going to have access to these technologies will become a more serious question as they matter more to our health and livelihood. In the long run, I think there will be a growing number of issues surrounding the strengthened role of states as compared to the role of international institutions or non-governmental actors. At the international level, this means more confrontation between nationalism and globalism. As we are in the age of globalization, logically, a global approach is needed in dealing with global issues. In recent years, however, we have witnessed an opposite trend looking like a surge of nationalism, especially in developed countries. The COVID-19 crisis is making this irony more conspicuous. In the post-pandemic world, voices of nationalists will keep rising, which will probably invite counter arguments in support of strengthened global cooperation and calling for collective wisdom. Also lastly, within many countries, the state-centered approach that has been warranted by the crisis will bring more debates in society. The private sector and civil society whose scope of activity has been growing fast in recent decades will raise questions if the government continue to dominate even after the crisis. Confrontation between them might be another noticeable feature in the post-COVID-19 world. I think I will stop here. Great, thank you so much, Ambassador O. Oh, you also have laid a lot on the table about the short versus the long term uh, and about the kind of national sovereignty versus these international. Uh, let me turn uh, to, to Beijing now in China and talk to uh, Ambassador Xi. Uh, Ambassador Xi, talking about uh, the need for international cooperation, what's the view uh, from there in China? Please. Okay. Ambassador Xi, can you can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Yes. It's just speaking. Now the Chinese uh, make a tremendous effort uh, to contain the virus spread. Now the life and the production resume normal gradually. And then another side, we also conducted. Cooperation, international cooperation to find the COVID-19 virus. So fr from your perspective there in China, what is the view about international cooperation and what, what, what do you see as kind of a post-COVID-19 world? How does it affect statecraft in the 21st century? Yeah, I think uh, uh, in the face of the epidemic, yeah, no country, can address or know the epidemic. So I hope every government should drive above the differences and the frictions and focus on thankfully the domestic uh, epidemics and, and focus on international cooperations, not the, the, the dump, the blame on other countries the labor of virus and uh, stigmatize some uh, specific countries. We should join hands. Do you have specific ways that you'd like to see uh, the world joining hands in areas that China would like to lead in the multinational community? Yes, yes we did. With, uh, from the international levels. Yeah, we work with uh, the WHO and some of the is regional institutions. On the bilaterals, we also send uh, some uh, medical supplies and uh, send uh, the medical teams to help them. All right, last question before I turn it to Ambassador Stevens. A lot of uh, China's foreign policy, like the Belt and Road Initiative and some of its diplomacy to help other countries in the face of uh, COVID-19 uh, has been very, uh, has taken a lot of different forms, economic, health, uh, security. Um, do you see this continuing and, and deepening, or do you think because of the economic crisis, China will have to focus more internally on making sure the health crisis is contained before it goes externally? Uh, you know, this is a 
the virus have uh, have impressions on economic and social activities. Yeah. So we we will do some uh, measures to reduce the impressions on the areas of our society. Great, thank you so much. Let me turn to uh, Ambassador Stevens there in Washington. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on uh, uh, this year, Kathleen, in terms of uh, the presidential election and kind of the, the, the debate happening in Washington about uh, all the issues we've just discussed, 21st century statecraft. Um, what, where is your perspective and how do you kind of see this playing out from a broader US perspective? Yeah, well, thank you, Joshua, and it's great to see uh, uh, many of my uh, friends and colleagues from years past uh, uh, from our careers in diplomacy uh, virtually on the screen. So thank you for this, this reunion. Um, I, I thought I would focus, as a, if you like, as a former diplomat, not so much on you know, my views as, a, as an American sitting here in Washington, where I, you know, I have my own views, and, and indeed it is that, that uh, the U.S. response, both domestically and internationally, has... Uh, uh, has not uh, lived up to some of the standards I would have hoped for, uh, uh, both in terms of transparency and following facts rather than politics. And uh, I think we've seen some of the the weaknesses in our own in our own uh, domestic politics and and in our institutions, which uh, we're addressing. But what I wanted to try to do is, given the title of this um, uh, this session, is is think a little bit about about statecraft and about uh, diplomatic approaches and. You know, I was thinking as I heard uh, Kanahara's uh, son start about, uh, you know, with, with the notion of grand strategy and I, I, you know, we could kind of channel our inner Kissingers here and talk about at this incredible inflection moment, transformational moment, what will the world look like afterwards? But I thought as a former diplomat, I consider myself more of like the engineer than the theoretical physicist, you know, and I think all of us in our diplomatic careers, and I've worked with a number of these gentlemen, um, have had to try to find practical solutions. You know, what do we do now? And we've experienced a lot of failure in those things, but also some successes. Um, I, just a couple of points I would make, and this is, I hope, the conversation we can have, but I, I get, uh, just a couple of points that kick it off. One, it won't surprise you to hear me say this, and maybe it's it, but given the immediate crises we face and, you know, the pandemic and economic recovery, uh, both in each of our countries and, and worldwide, you know, international coordination, communication, cooperation, it's not a choice. It's not, to me, it's not debatable, it's a necessity. And I do think that a defining lesson coming out of this is that countries who do try to go it alone or succumb to narrower zero sum uh, uh, nationalism are not going to su su succeed now and not going to succeed going forward in what is to me an irretrievably <laughs> globalized world with global, with global threats and challenges. Um, of course, I mean, the notion of, of international engagement has underpinned US statecraft since World War II. Uh, the US uh, clearly played a, a leading role in shaping those institutions and, and basic principles of statecraft that were widely adopted and I think have, have had success not just for the United States, but more broadly for all the countries represented here and, and more broadly for the world, but are not, as we are seeing now, without its weaknesses. But the US, as having been the largest and strongest voice to date, through our alliances, through our support and shaping of a variety of international institutions, we have a special responsibility, given our power to be, and our size, to be responsible in its use. Um, and uh, I think we can get into a discussion of, of I think where we, where we are being that way and where maybe we can be a little more responsible. Um, I wanted also to say a word about this uh, notion of traditional security threats versus the non-traditional. Again, this is not a new idea, right? And uh, I mean, for years we've been talking about non-traditional or sometimes we say transnational threats and public health is certainly one, climate change, human trafficking, narcotics, there's a range of them. But right, they haven't gotten, certainly in the United States, and I think more broadly, the kind of funding, um, the kind of political attention, for better or worse, that those more traditional, if you like, military and security threats have gotten. But that said, uh, to be a little, I, I, I and I, I know some of my colleagues here, we've actually spent a lot of time working on a lot of non-traditional uh, uh, issues. Uh, I, I mentioned a couple of them. I spent some of my most interesting diplomatic years working on the issues of biological diversity, sustainable logging, 
Uh, they sound like niche issues, but they're, they're, my point here is we actually do have some tools in our toolkit for addressing things like this. And I would say in particular, uh, when it comes to public health, one thing that's been a little bit, um, I think, overlooked, uh, at least in the United States in this crisis, is that there, there is uh, an international framework and the WHO, of course, is, is, is part of it, and in our, an American leadership uh, in the past uh, on addressing public health. I mean, I'm old enough to still have uh, from the 1970s, my little yellow inoculation card, right? Which I had to, I used to have to have that with stapled in the back of your passport to even get admission to a country that lasted for decades. It's probably coming back. Uh, but my point here is the international community, if I may use those words, um, has had considerable success in the area of public health. And much of that has been with an important American lead. Uh, the U.S. has also, of course, uh, uh, on its own done quite a few things, which I think uh, we can be rightly proud of. The PEPFAR initiative started by President George W. Bush and continued through successive administrations to address, to address uh, HIV AIDS, particularly in Africa, was a multi-billion dollar concerted effort, nonpartisan, widely supported, uh, that has been incredibly successful. So one thing I would like to see us do is to build on some of these successes and experiences of the past, which are now really in the, in the spotlight. And you know, that takes us, I think, to some of the press coverage we've seen today of the meeting uh, uh, yesterday of the WHO in, um, uh, in Geneva and some of the tensions and challenges uh, we face now. Uh, we saw at that meeting, I'm just going for, by the press reporting, I've read about it yesterday, um, something that reminded me a little bit, sadly, of, of the Cold War when the U.S. and the USSR, in this great power rivalry, tended to uh, make it impossible for the international institutions to be perhaps as effective uh, as they could be. Uh, and yesterday we saw that kind of pushing and pulling. And what did we see? We saw actually a lot of American allies. And I do think that American alliances and allies are not only the bright spot of U.S. statecraft uh, up to this, up to now, but as we look around the world and see where the successful responses to the pandemic have been, uh, it, it, we do number, including those uh, Japan and South Korea, Germany and other allies, uh, we see uh, in, in them some of the most successful responses to the pandemic. So there was this coalition, if you like, of uh, US allies and, and others and partners uh, who were trying to find a bit of a middle way between uh, uh, China and the United States in this, uh, in this standoff with the WHO. Uh, so my answer is, uh, right, strengthen these institutions. Uh, they need to be, and this is not new, this is not something that, that comes out of the pandemic itself, but we understand that in a changing world, these institutions do need to be adapted or to, uh, to the changes. But I think we're reminded of how important they are and they are not there to be uh, uh, delegitimized, but rather I think uh, to be empowered. Um, I guess my final point is, is um, uh, on, on economic, uh, the economic recovery piece of it. Um, I had just arrived actually in Korea as a, a U.S. ambassador in 2008, the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed. Uh, and I well recall the worry of, of obviously, was this going to be a repeat of the Asian financial crisis? How was this going to work? And there was an institution that had just been set up not so long ago called the G20 of which, of course, all the nations represented here are members. It had not been terribly active before that. It was activated, uh, and it played an enormous role uh, in ensuring that countries like uh, South Korea and Japan, China, as well as larger countries like China and the US, had a seat at the table and found a way through. It has been a disappointment to me uh, that to date in this crisis, the G20 and the G7 have been underused uh, again, I think the U.S. Has a, has a special responsibility in this because of its leadership, uh, and China as well. But I think that this role that the middle, if you like, the middle powers will come. This is, this is maybe a little bit the rise of the rest uh, in trying to invigorate some of these existing institutions and reshape them, as well as seeing what else is needed here is what we're going to need uh, to, uh, to move forward through this crisis and beyond. Thank you. You laid a lot on the table. And let me just pick up right where you left off and turn it over to uh, Kanehara-san to ask for your reaction uh, to this idea. You talked about the liberal international order 
uh, and the rising tension between Japan's closest security ally, the United States, and its closest economic partner in China, where you're literally caught in the middle. And this crisis seems to have only exasperated some of the tensions that were there that were building, but now have really come to a forefront because of domestic politics and other issues. Um, so if that's the case, how do, how do you think about priorities for the international system. Ambassador Stevens just laid the idea that maybe if the U.S. and China are locked into a global struggle, countries like Japan and Korea could play a role, especially uh, in a crisis like this, where it's less about uh, states uh, in some ways, and it's more about our private sector and our multilateral institutions. How do you see Japan's role in that? And then how do you think we should prioritize uh, international relations moving forward from here? Or do we think that uh, the, si the, the system as it is, is not changing fundamentally, and we need to pay attention to these major uh, conflicts, as you mentioned, North Korea, South China Sea? How do you think about priorities in the international system for Japan and others? We'll have to distinguish levels. Now we have to take care of CB19. This is urgent one. We have to work for that. And secondly, improvements of international organizations. We need them. They're doing good jobs, but we need to improve them. They are international organizations. They, are not, they have no parliaments. There has no democratic control. And the, the bureaucrats are there. The huge amount of money is powered automatically by the sovereign states. And we have to sometimes check the management. That's true. And we have to do that. This is for the next, next stage. The third one, the big power competition between China and the United States, uh, that's, we, we, are not, we are not the superpower. <laughs> we are worried about this. But the, the one thing is that Chinese rise is, is something natural. They're being industrialized. They're taking back their own size and the balance is being changed and you cannot stop this power shift. India is on the line, they are coming next. We have to keep this transition period stable. We need big efforts here. And this is a very big, big issue in the long run. It will continue up maybe up to 2040, 2050. And this is a very different problem from the actual coronavirus things or improvement of international organizations. And Ambassador uh, Oh, let me bring you into the conversation because of, of the countries that we're discussing, uh, Korea and your leader have really benefited from uh, the reaction and kind of the response to this. You know, he won a resounding victory. Um, how does Korea think about its role in this international system of reordering as we deal with this? You know, unlike after World War II, where really it was the U.S., uh, and kind of the allied powers that shaped the international system. Uh, Korea was not uh, at the table. Japan wasn't there either. Uh, how does Korea think about a new world in which having uh, health vaccines? I mean, Korea has been sending its testing system to the United States, to Maryland, to others. Uh, it seems to be playing a more active role internationally. How do you see it in Korea? But then also as a, as a UN uh, diplomat, how do you see that affecting exactly what Ambassador Stevens was saying, uh, it playing out in the international system, at the UN, at the G20, multilateral institutions? How can we channel this, perhaps in a positive as opposed to a negative direction? Well, in coping with this crisis, as I said earlier, uh, I think uh, South Korea is uh, um, doing reasonably well, but uh, it's still too early to call, um, you know, um, who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong. Uh, not least because um, we have to see, you know, until there is a medical solution, until there is a vaccine, or until there is what is called herd immunity. Um, you know, when countries start to open up, uh, reopen again, we have to see. Um, but, you know, this crisis is so overwhelming, I think, and, um, the, the, the responses from the countries, um, whether they are doing uh, well or not, um, you know, that kind of shows their uh, urgency, they fear about uh, this crisis because it's almost like an existential threat. Um, so um, contrary to what uh, we expect, under this kind of uh, crisis situation, um, you know, nations are not getting united to stand up to this challenge together. 
you know, we, we see a lot of uh, blaming games going on. Um, that's, that's sometimes puzzling, you know, when we have this crisis. I think we should, uh, we should put our problems on the back burner and we should come together. But that's not what we are seeing. So there can be different explanations about, you know, this failure of uh, unity, lack of unity among nations. Maybe because of domestic politics, you know, every country, this is such a huge crisis. So it, it naturally affects uh, political status of the leader. So they are so uh, desperate. So they are showing some responses that are not easily uh, uh, you know, understood. Maybe there are some other reasons. You know, we, uh, when it comes to our security, uh, countries tend to become more selfish. And uh, maybe that's the reason. But the bottom line is that we want to see, you know, we meaning the citizens of the, the, the world, citizens of uh, all the countries, we want to see uh, greater uh, cooperation. We want to see collective wisdom in pulling together in, in, in addressing this uh, crisis situation. Um, so in that sense, in our part of the world, uh, you know, uh, Korea, Japan, China, uh, all these countries, we have our uh, ongoing issues, you know, uh, but I don't know if this crisis will help us uh, kind of moving forward uh, in, 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 in settling these uh, existing issues under the circumstances. I, I wish I could, we could see that, but I'm, I, I, I'm not quite sure. Thank you. I want to return to, to that point with you, but let me turn to Ambassador Xi and get a Chinese perspective. You've heard about, uh, and, and you yourself talked about uh, the, the blame game going on and, and kind of the, the feeling that, that, that China uh, doesn't want to play that game. How do you see the tensions with the U.S. playing out? How does this affect China's view of the international system? Uh, do you see China playing a bigger role in trying to be a larger player at the WHO, at G20, at the UN Security Council? What's China's role in this? I think uh, at the current uh, the situation, multilateralism is what we need to address global challenges in globalized world. We need to see the world as one community. Global governance and international coordination must be strengthened instead of being weakened. We should work to improve and boost the role of the existing international organizations, such as the UN, WTO, and WHO. We should uphold a new vision featuring common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. One nation's security cannot be built on another's insecurity. No country should seek absolute security for itself and the expense of others. Only increased mutual trust and cooperation can lead to sustainable security for. For this vision of security, we need to increase mutual understanding and avoid misjudgment differences and disagreement between countries should not be justification for confrontation and the conflict between them. Rather, we should see them as opportunities and a potential for complementarity and cooperation. As for China-US relations, our perspective is that we should work together. But now we have some problem. I think cooperation is the only one choice between our two countries. But now, some American politicians always blame China. Most Chinese people are very confused because if you confuse, uh, accuse the other countries, you must respect the facts. But some, mostly the, the communists. So I'm very sad. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Stevens, let's return to, to where you left off about the international system and your hope that some of these would step up. And when you first went to Korea, uh, G20 uh, really rising to the occasion of the, 
the financial crisis. Um, what's the hope out there? Who is it? Do you think it's the G20? I mean, last year, uh, Japan held a very successful G20. It's probably the last one that was in person. We have the G20 coming up here, but it'll probably be done virtually. Can you, can you have cooperation with just virtual uh, uh, interaction? And kind of from, a, from an on-the-ground practitioner's point of view, if you were still in uh, the government today and you were still an ambassador in Korea or at the UN, what would your advice be in terms of how to kind of deal with this crisis with the current statecraft and, and tools available to us? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my main advice, I guess, from a, uh, from, from a U.S. perspective would be to try to, you know, work to build uh, coalitions with you know, like-minded allies and partners for a way forward. I mean, that is kind of classic diplomacy, if you like. But, uh, but yeah, not make it a zero-sum game. Um, in terms of the question, I mean, yeah, and I'm not wed to one institution or another, and there may be some other ad hoc ones that uh, that emerge out of this and probably already have, but um, uh, certainly virtual diplomacy must be harder as, as this kind of conversation is than all being in person. But, you know, I'd really commend to, to people to read, uh, as of the press reporting I mentioned earlier on this, uh, this, this WHO decision in, um, uh, well, in Geneva, but I guess it was virtual, right? Uh, but there was a whole sort of negotiation that went on. Uh, but the interesting thing about it was the, the, the kind of, if you like, again, the countries in the middle, the ones who feel caught between China and the U.S. And I mean, uh, well, between, between the two, wanted to find a way to try to move the process forward and, and did that. Um, so, so that's, that's diplomacy in action, if you like, that's statecraft in action. Uh, but the interesting thing to me is I think that, that both, you know, the United States and China in some ways were somewhat marginalized by it. And that's not, and that's not going to be, a, I think, a permanent state of affairs. I mean, maybe I would also just back up and uh, kind of following up on what Ambassador O said. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's obvious that, that, that there were tensions in the U.S.-China relationship, and indeed, even broader, I think, uh, broad concerns with, if I may say, the international community about, about um, not, not only, I mean, China's response to the coronavirus in terms of transparency so in the early days, but also, I mean, well before that, in terms of the, uh, the shifts in the international environment. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we did have a situation where China was saying, you know, uh, and I welcome it. You know, we, 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 we like the international order, but we want to have it. I don't want to put words in China's mouth, more reflective of China's, China's rise. Uh, and in the US, uh, I think our response, uh, particularly uh, uh, under our current political leadership has, has, has not been helpful because it's been, it's, it's been uh, I think, you said somewhat more than somewhat confrontational. Um, but all of this has been exacerbated by the situation that we're in now and this kind of blame game, which I, which I agree is, um, uh, is, is very, very uh, counterproductive. So my advice uh, in terms of, uh, and in particular from a US perspective is to play to our strengths and our strengths are our allies, our strengths are our values, our strengths are our partners, our strengths are our institutions, which uh, both domestic institutions and democratic institutions, as well as international institutions, which we have played such a, uh, such a role in shaping. I, I would, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I would return to those, knowing that we need to adapt to those, knowing that other voices uh, need to be uh, uh, more taken into account uh, uh, in, across the world. And certainly uh, there needs to be uh, a means of, of working with China uh, in everywhere, everywhere where we can. And when it comes to a global pandemic, uh, that seems like to an obvious place where, uh, you know, as others have said, there are just no boundaries and we, we need to work together. Thank you. So, uh, Kanahara san you were in the government for the last G20 there in Osaka. Obviously, we were hoping that by this time this year, we'd be getting ready for the Olympics in Tokyo, but that's been postponed till next year. Um, clearly, Japan has played a very significant international role under Prime Minister Abe, the longest serving prime minister in Japanese history, and also as a global statesman. Uh, having worked with him and thinking about Japan's role, um, how do you think about individual leaders versus countries and think about the kind of the different levels that you describe and also thinking about the short term versus the long term? Um, what this means if America and China are, are engaging in a back and forth of global struggle, um, where is there space 
for a country like Japan or any of America's allies, particularly not just in the bilateral context, but maybe the trilateral context or the Indo-Pacific context? Where does Japan see uh, space and where do you as a, as a broader thinker, as a grand strategist, see uh, this playing out until 2040, 2050, as you, you said earlier? Well, I have to say that the, you know, the main players change in 1970s, Germany and Japan were putting the world economy together with the US were called locomotives. It just at the time of oil shocks and we survived that together by G7, G20, Lehman shock, China helps us a lot, right? And China became the second world's economy and they, they pulled the world economy at the Lehman shock time. And now this one, we need leadership again. G7 is now a bit smaller, we need G20. But G7, China is not there, but G20, without cooperation between US and China, it can never be successful. And G20 is a bit more difficult at this time. And in the long run, um, we should not identify leader's character with the nation's character. There's no nation's character. Um, leaders change. There are some sort of strong leaders are very often patriotic, but very often we have international type of leaders. In, in Russia, we had Gorbachev, and then we had Putin now. And in China, we had the Fuyabao was talking about democracy with us. And then it's the leaders change and surrounding circumstances change when the necessity is there bad economy, pandemics, nations tend to, tend to cooperate. So we should not take it for granted that this nation is bad, this nation is good, this leader is bad, this leader is bad. They change, a nation changes more. And there are a lot of rooms for cooperation in the future, I believe. Thank you. Ambassador Oh, you talked about the fact that uh, this pandemic uh, seemed to be exacerbating uh, some of the problems. Instead of bringing people together, people were reverting to nationalism and, and kind of uh, America first or, or China's rise, as opposed to thinking about ways of bringing us together, even though at the end of the day, we're all susceptible to the virus as human beings. It's not because I'm American that it's going to get me more than you as a Korean or Japanese. And yet, it seems that Asia, this crisis has squarely put Asia uh, on the forefront. As my friend Prag Khanna would say, this is Asia's century because Europe's response and America's response to this has been so underwhelming in comparison to most of the success stories of which, of course, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, and Singapore, and Hong Kong come to mind. How do you see this uh, shifting that power balance? I mean, it already was changing with China's rise and obviously uh, with a trans-Pacific rather than a transatlantic focus. Um, how does that play out uh, with Korea that still is divided, still has to balance itself between China, US, and then with Japan and, and, and Indo-Pacific? But if you think about it, this pandemic crisis is affecting um, Asia and North America and Europe most seriously, you know, is uh, spreading to the rest of the world, but, uh, you know, probably in other parts of the world like Africa and Latin America, well, Latin America, Brazil seems to be suffering, but, uh, you know, so far, uh, these three uh, regions, Asia, North America and Europe are most seriously affected. And you know, when I said that uh, this crisis doesn't seem to help in kind of uh, mitigating the, the existing uh, problems we had, you know, because I thought uh, under this situation, we might as well uh, put our issues on the shelf and come together, but that is not, that is not happening. I don't know why not, but for whatever reason, once uh, the crisis is uh, over, uh, once we uh, go back to kind of normalcy, uh, once there is a medical solution, then I think we will all be faced with economic consequences. That would probably be as bad as uh, any uh, previous economic recessions we had. Um, then that will also require greater uh, cooperation among nations. 
So the cooperation among nations that is not visible, not much of it is visible currently, maybe because this crisis is so overwhelming, would, would we be able to see it uh, when we are tackling economic crisis that is coming after this? I hope so, but uh, you know we are not sure. But dealing with economic crisis is probably an issue we are more familiar with. You know, we have had economic recessions in the past. We have a uh, World Bank, we have IMF, we have all the necessary economic institutions that have been dealing with, uh, you know, uh, periodic um, uh, recessions and, and, and downturns in economy. So that we, we might be able to utilize uh, the institutions like uh, G20 or G7, uh, whatever, uh, United Nations, uh, more effectively when it comes to uh, dealing with the economic crisis. Um, but the, the issue you mentioned, uh, the what's going to happen the, uh, to the uh, kind of uh, transition in terms of uh, power balance in the world, probably because we are holding that issue, uh, you know, still for a while, uh, because we are so busy. All of us are so occupied with uh, coping with the pandemic. So we are putting it on the shelf. But when we go back to that, when we go back to that, I mean, after the, after the, uh, after tackling the economic crisis, when you go back to normalcy. So now, then we will think about what's going to happen in the uh, strategic balance, uh, what's going to happen in terms of uh, the, the uh, Sino or American rivalry. Um, that it's not like we are just, uh, you know, putting it on the shelf and bring it back. Because this crisis and also the economic crisis that's coming up are so enormous. So they will probably affect uh, the, 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 the existing issues the existing uh, uh, power game we had before. Uh, but how that's gonna play out is, uh, I think everybody's guess. Um, it's a little too early to, to, to tell that now, I think. Thank you. And Ambassador Xi, how do you see the balance between national sovereignty and international cooperation, not just in this crisis, but moving forward? relations between the defined sovereignty and international cooperation. I would like to have a follow three points to share with our colleagues. Yeah, firstly, there is no contradiction between the defining sovereignty and promoting international cooperation. The UN Charter, the sovereignty principle coexists with international cooperation. Furthermore, we should not deny the reality that sovereignty countries are still the main player in the world and also the major decision maker and the driving forces behind all international cooperation. Taking the fight against the COVID-19 as an example, we of course highly appreciate the private sector's civil society's contributions, but it is not difficult to witness how important the sovereign states choose to cooperate with each other. Secondly, we should have a clear understanding of the differences between the defending sovereignty and acting nationalistically with the I force principle. Defending sovereignty means defending the principle laid out in the UN Charter, that is, all countries are equal and should be non intervention without any implication of rejecting cooperation on the equal base. In the past 75 years, we have witnessed so many fruitful and mutual beneficial cooperation among different sovereign states, let me say in trade areas on climate change issues, etc. China and US have also ever cooperated a lot in finding the common challenges to help the world with, with, with the different crises. The world still remembers the beautiful days when China and US cooperated to deal with the SARS 2008 financial crisis and the fight against H1N1, etc. While acting nationalistically 
in the practice means unilateral policies and the expenses of the others' rights and interests, which set the barriers between the different states leading to the news to news situation. We could not imagine what kind of the war we would leave to the next generation with a paralyzed WTO broken climate change deal and a finally fragmented and chaotic the world. Last but not least, I would like to say international cooperation could better defend sovereignty. In today's globalized world, all sovereignty states are closely interlinked with each other, facing common challenges, which is a so play where the whole world are threatened by the coronavirus. No country could defeat himself on his own since the virus does not have a passport. Through the co cooperation, we could better defend life, defend the economy, and finally defend the sovereignty. If we look at the EU integration process, there always exists the tension between sovereignty and integration, a typical way of cooperation, but the main trend of EU is always more cooperation because the experience, experiences we will show us the cooperation could be better serve the interest. This Thank you. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, so, so uh, Ambassador Stevens, let me come to you and then I'm going to be opening this up to some of the questions we received. Um, I, I love your kind of thoughts on what you just heard uh, and kind of uh, putting your experience and also putting on the internationalist kind of American hat and how you see this playing out, uh, not just in the elections this year, but uh, America's role in the world moving forward. Yeah, well, that's a that's a big question. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think both within, the, if you like, the American uh, domestic political context and uh, and in the you know international situation as it as it exists now, um, this notion of a of a tension between sovereignty and you know international engagement um, is, is is not a new issue. Uh, but I, I think it has become even more, if you like, kind of politicized and, uh, and, and, and used uh, in, in ways that have, have not been very helpful. I think, uh, yeah, again, from the point of view of diplomatic experience, and certainly as an American diplomat, you know, you're very mindful of, of the need to balance. I mean, uh, uh, both the kind of political realities of the United States, and this goes back to you know the pre-Trump administration, to others of, of when, when the United States negotiates international treaties, and which are the law of the sea, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, we're not members of either of those, but in fact, both of those conventions re uh, really reflect U.S. practice and U.S. law in very deep ways. Uh, so there is, I think, as as as, as international as, as practitioners, we have to be mindful, and as an American, uh, that we have political realities here. Other countries have others. But how do you uh, reconcile that with uh, with your national interests, with your values, and with your uh, 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 and with your international relationships? I wanted to make one point about, and I, I agree with uh, what others said about, like the G20, for example. And I just wanted to add on that, if I could, that. But these organizations, whatever they are, it also depends on kind of who's in the chair at any one time. And uh, South Korea happened to hold the chair of the, the G20 uh, uh, shortly after the, uh, first it was London and then Seoul after the uh, crisis of 2008, Japan had it recently. Right now it's Saudi Arabia. I think that does complicate it somewhat. I'll just leave it there. Um, when it comes to the United Nations, sorry, I'm taking a little bit of time here, but I, when it comes to the United Nations, which is another place where, uh, from an American uh, uh, perspective, sometimes uh, that's, that's seen as just the existence uh, in, in some quarters as kind of a threat to American sovereignty. I mean, I, uh, I have family in a state where uh, there are still billboards that say, get out of the United Nations now, because uh, it's a threat on our sovereignty. Um, some of this, I think, is just a, a lack of, of uh, or, or in, in inadequate understanding that the United Nations and its, its constituent organizations, whether it's the World Health Organization or any others, only operate uh, when the member states support it in doing that. And in particular, when the permanent members of the, of the Security Council, the P5, support it. And again, that's where the United States and China have a, have a particular responsibility. Uh, but I think that one of the unfortunate things within an American context, and this gets into I think the kinds of things we're trying to do here, is, is there's just not a clear understanding that we do have uh, uh, 
great uh, uh, influence and ability to uh, protect uh, and defend our own uh, sovereign and national interests uh, within these contexts. But what's happened, unfortunately, is that right now, I think these, these organizations have really been sidelined. And the other example, I guess I would point to is I'm very disappointed that, um, uh, that the initiative that Secretary General Guterres had uh, proposed at the beginning of this pandemic, that uh, this might be an opportunity for the Security Council to uh, pass a resolution that would call for ceasefires uh, across the world, you know, in a variety, and, and all the conflicts, low level high con conflicts going on in the context of addressing a pandemic. My understanding is just no traction for it. And a lot of that goes to the US-China uh, uh, confrontation uh, and the positions that, uh, that Washington and, and, and others have taken in this context. And I think that's very, uh, to use that great uh, diplomatic word, regrettable. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I see questions are beginning to come in. I'm going to try to incorporate the questions I've already received and then some that I see popping up right now. But let me start with a really big one uh, and kind of get your all's take. Uh, one of the questions that we were asked is, how do you see the future of non-proliferation regime? Uh, how do you see the international community being able to deal with states that are determined to have nuclear capability? So this squarely fits on the traditional side. Uh, obviously, Kana Hadassan, you mentioned North Korea. Um, how do you see the international non-proliferation regime uh, kind of playing out, uh, if at all, affected by this current crisis? Mm. Well, I don't know how this crisis would affect the international um, non-proliferation non regime. We have said that we were successful in persuading Ukraine and Kazakhstan abandon the nukes, Libya abandoned the nukes, South Korea abandoned the nukes, and then the, the, but there are some, some other nations and India, Pakistan had nukes. And now we are now seeing North Korea and Iran. North Korea have nukes. Iran is under free issues, but we don't know the future. Uh, we have to keep this and the, this, this non-proliferation regime is, is important simply because nuclear weapons are not usable. It's for just for deterrence, it's expensive. And some nations have them. It's not necessary to proliferate them. But my, my, my fears are Oh, for non-nuclear powers, we're successful to contain this to North Korea and Iran. But in, among the nuclear powers, my, my, my fear is that the nuclear weapons are becoming more and more usable. So they are, they are downsized and it's very, it's, very, it's very dangerous. Nuclear weapons must stay, must stay strategic uh, for deterrence and for the stability. They contributed to prevent the Third World War, it's true. But when it is usable, it becomes very dangerous. And on, for non-nuclear powers, we have to stay vigilant against North Korea, and we have to pressure the Iran. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Oh, in terms of uh, Korea and also your work at the UN, um, how do you see this kind of very traditional security threat, kind of nuclear weapons and kind of the, the international non-proliferation regime uh, that as Kanahara Hassan has mentioned, North Korea and Iran are sometimes the most egregious, but you have others like India and Pakistan that are outside of that, uh, that undermine the credibility of an international system. And as uh, you know, this crisis or any other crisis uh, begins to draw tension at the international system, how do you see that playing out? And specifically on the Korean Peninsula, uh, how do you see that playing out? I agree with uh, Kanehara Sang about not knowing uh, how this crisis will affect or not affect the non-proliferation regime. Um, well, when it comes to the, the ongoing North Korean nuclear issue, um, if this crisis also uh, uh, affects North Korea, and if there is any uh, need for uh, cooperation between two Koreas or between North Korea and United States in coping with the public health crisis in North Korea, that might change a little, you know, that might change the attitude of players a little. But so far, North Korea is saying that they, they don't have, uh, you know, cases, um, even though the pictures coming out from North Korea uh, show that almost everyone is wearing face mask. So, we don't know uh, if they will uh, come out and they will ask for uh, help uh, from the outside world. If that happens, that, that might uh, 
be a factor in 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 dealing with the uh, North Korean nuclear issue in the in the future. Um, but if uh, that doesn't happen, and you know this particular crisis uh, does not affect uh, any future, uh, you know, uh, denuclearization uh, negotiations between uh, the U.S. and North Korea, and from the perspective of South Korea, I know that the uh, the government in South Korea is now very uh, forthcoming about uh, helping North Korea. Um, probably our government is very willing to, uh, you know, uh, resume our talks and resume our cooperation, especially under the uh, circumstances, under the uh, the the pandemic crisis, but. So far, we haven't seen any response from North Korea. We don't know if if that's because they, they don't have any problems or if they do have problems, it's manageable. We don't know. Uh, but uh, so this crisis might or might not uh, affect the North Korea's issue in the future. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Xi, the same question to you, but given what you said before about the good old days of uh, U.S.-China cooperation, are there areas that potentially uh, there are uh, possibilities for cooperation if COVID has brought out uh, the worst in some ways of blame game? Uh, is it, it, are there possibilities on non-traditional, whether that's in the, the climate change, cyber space, or other domains that you see us being brought together, or even on the traditional side, North Korea, where uh, the U.S. and China have to work together. Otherwise, like we saw a couple of weeks ago when the, the, the leader of North Korea disappeared from public view, everyone began to speculate and everyone was looking to China for answers. Do you see areas that will bring uh, the U.S. and China together on an international stage moving forward? Yeah, the delocalization in the the in the Korea, the North Korea's uh, in the Korea Peninsula, the China and the U.S. had the same goals. Yeah, delocalization in the Korea Peninsula, uh, we have same goals. I think the China and the U.S. should work together. We firstly, you know, the key player in this issue, U.S. and North Korea. North Korea and the U.S. should conducted a direct dialogue and uh, make a compromise. And then other related partners join them to work together to find solutions. So firstly, they conducted a dialogue and uh, the consultations. Thank you. Uh, are there areas on non, are there areas in non-traditional security that you see uh, that are going to be more dangerous moving forward in the U.S.? There's been a lot of accusations about what China is doing in cyber and in space. Are there ways of kind of uh, uh, mitigating these concerns? Yes. You know, cyber insecurity is a popular issue in the world. Now, China is also the victim of the, the cyber the insecurities. I think we, China and the U.S., all the international community should work together to prevent these things happen. You Thank know, you. Americans, uh, Americans have high technologies, especially in the, the, the cyber areas, have, uh, so, uh, uh, have uh, the operation system, have uh, uh, a a chip, yeah, have a chip. The operation system is advanced in the world. So uh, Americans have, have advantages in these areas. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Stevens, yeah. he, he raises a good point. Uh, of course, the difference is that in the US, the private sector that has achieved these things and the government are very different. How, how does America uh, think about this moving forward? And if you were thinking about the same question, traditional versus non-traditional, where's like the areas that we should have optimism and where are the areas that you're fairly pessimistic about where we're headed? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I hope and I, 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 want to, I, I, I want to be optimistic that, um, that our lessons from, from dealing with this pandemic uh, will be lessons that we can take into an international effort uh, on climate change. Um, that to me is, is, is the, 
my the biggest one um, in terms of something that just has not has failed to get sustained traction is international response. Uh, but key to this is, as uh, Ambassador Chi's response suggested, is I think the the future of the U.S.-China relationship. And as we've already discussed, I mean that already uh, was uh, moving into a period of much greater confrontation and even crisis uh, even before this pandemic hit. So you know, in a way, I hope this will this will allow us to step back and, as you've done, think about where do we have some shared interests. Uh, I agree on the on the non-proliferation front, uh, and particularly when it comes to the denuclearization of of, of North Korea, uh, we have some shared interests. Uh, and you know, we used to say, right, that we we were so economically intertwined that we had a lot of shared interests. Now that you know that has that has has uh, shifted, uh, and I certainly count myself among those who I'm very disturbed about. Um, I'm very disturbed about some things in my own country, but I'm I'm, I'm very disturbed about about some directions that China has taken uh, in recent years. We need to be very upfront about those, but I. Uh, I think that what we need to avoid is, is kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy that we are destined for conflict. And indeed, to, uh, uh, to, think, to say it's inevitable that we've got to figure out a way to, um, uh, to live together uh, and to uh, address these really difficult issues. But, uh, you know, cyber, a lot of these goes to, you know, transparency, it goes to trust. Uh, and uh, a lot of that, to the extent we had it, uh, uh, to some extent in earlier years on some, on some, on some issues has been lost. Uh, we need to get back to it. But I, w I would start, I, I think climate change and, and perhaps non-proliferation uh, are a couple of areas where it might be good to, uh, uh, to start as well as, as well as public health, if we can you know, get, get past this, 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 this blame game that we're in now. Great, thank you. So we have about 15 minutes left. I saw three live questions. I've already incorporated one of them about the traditional threat. Two of them were very specific and they actually were directed uh, to Kaneharasan san and Ambassador Xi. So I'm gonna ask them briefly to you, uh, but then I'm gonna ask you to try to wrap this into a broader framework so we can have a broader dialogue. One is, you know, Kaneharasan, san you talked about uh, the South China Sea and one of the questions was about that. I'm gonna ask Ambassador Xi about uh, what China has been doing in the South China Sea. In the midst of this tension, uh, there's more tension in the South China Sea. And the other was uh, a question specifically about Russia, how you know it seemed like Japan and Russia were on a very favorable track uh, before. Now we don't hear much about that and there's not as much conversation about that. So I guess uh, the question about the Northern Ireland question for Japan and the Abe-Putin relationship we don't hear about. Uh, and then uh, the other is kind of Japan's position on the South China Sea. Uh, as we think about regional cooperation, um, how, does, uh, how, how do we think about regional cooperation? We've talked a lot about big international, but what about in the specific area of, of East Asia, things like the East Asia Summit uh, and these regional security architecture, something that people have always criticized that while Europe had a, a long uh, history since World War II of regional security cooperation, Asia's lacking this. You know, how do you think about it in these two specific contexts and, and kind of where America can or cannot play a role in these regional architectures? Well, that's very interesting. During the Cold War, the Europeans have an international organization bridging East and West, right? But the Eastern, Western Europe was the free, free world, truly. In Asia, there was no democracy here. And now in 1980s, 1990s, many, many, US, many were born as democracies. And there are three important things. One is US commitments of security matters. If you cannot manage Japan-US alliance, US Rock alliance, US Philippine alliance, US Thai alliance, and US Australia alliance, and the economic, your integration of the regional, the regional economic integrations through the mega FTA, these things, the sorry for withdrawal from TPP of the United States. The third, the newly born democracies are shaky, but they're very proud of their democracies. They're no longer pupils. They are equal partners to us. But for that, we need a leadership here. We are trying to do that, but we are not enough. And without the American commitment, we are shattered. And with U.S. commitments, we can make a good, good community here. And we believe that we can be in good terms with China in this framework. Without your commitments, remember, after the U.S., uh, the U.K.-Japan alliance was broken, and U.S. proposed the League of Nations, and you proposed Washington regime in Asia, you did not commit your force here. 
and everything was shattered very easily in 1930s. If you have ideas, that's fine, but you have to strengthen your alliances in the Pacific. Without your commitment, there's no stability in the Pacific. Russia, uh, we, are, we are trying to improve ties with Russia. That's strategic imperative. During the Cold War, the territory issue was not truly really territory issue. It was a strategic issue. It was between East and West. And there was a very clear limit to approach Russians. Now the Cold War is over. It's quite natural that we have to improve our ties with, Russia, with Russians, trying to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to Ambassador Xi on China, Ambassador uh, Oh, in terms of the future of regional institutions and how you manage a region and continent as big uh, and as complicated and with a history like uh, East Asia's, um, how do you think about regional architecture uh, going forward? You talked about the immediate health crisis coming out of it, the next major issue of economics that maybe we feel more comfortable, but then whatever comes next, whether, whether it's traditional uh, security threats or non-traditional in the cyber uh, area, trying to understand what the gray zones now look like. How do you think about uh, that new uh, Asian architecture moving forward? If we look back on history uh, about 20 years ago uh, in East Asia, uh, there was there was quite a, a good mood for uh, regional um, regional cooperation and even regional integration. You know, we were trying to build on ASEAN that was already there. So we created ASEAN plus three, and we also uh, established uh, the trilateral uh, dialogue mechanism among China, Japan, and South Korea. So that that became a kind of annual feature for a while. Um, so a lot of people thought, you know, in East Asia, we might uh, be able to replicate what, uh, what was happening in Europe, you know, like European integration. Um, but after that, you know, things were not getting better. Things were not uh, moving forward. Um, you know, actually we, we, in, in the coming years, we have seen more issues, problems, historical issues between Japan and South Korea, between China and Japan. And in, in some years, we didn't even have trilateral summit. You know, we skipped some summits uh, because it was because of these uh, kind of conflicts. And, and even uh, the, the the group of ASEAN countries, uh, they themselves were kind of lost momentum in moving forward towards uh, uh, integration. You know, uh, I, I, I was once ambassador in Singapore. I, I think that's partly or mainly because there is greater diversity among ASEAN countries these days. Some are more democratic, some are not. Some are more prosperous economically some are less prosperous. So compared to 20 years ago, even ASEAN countries are more diverse. That kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, mitigated the momentum for uh, regional integration. And in, in the Northeastern partners, especially three countries of ours, uh, you know, not making much of progress in terms of uh, building uh, a community in our part of the world, which is a shame. Um, but if we think about it, you know, we cannot just uh, uh, move on without settling some issues. You know, some of the issues uh, better be buried there, but some of the issues you need to settle it uh, one way or another. So that's very difficult. These are very difficult issues. And that's why they keep coming back. Um, so some people say, you know, in Europe, uh, they, they, they are now able to uh, go for greater integration because they settled all these issues through the two world wars uh, in the 20th century. But to settle the war, to settle the problems, we cannot go through another war in our part of the uh, world. You know, that's not a desirable way out. So um, overall, I think, um, once we go through these challenges uh, together, uh, including this pandemic crisis, I hope 
we can come up with a better spirit of cooperation and better needs for uh, uh, you know cooperation and uh, uh, working together uh, among different countries because all of us are affected by the crisis. All of us have to face uh, the economic crisis that is coming up. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Xi, the question about uh, China's actions in the South China Sea uh, and kind of how that fits into the, the broader uh, implications, but more broadly, China's view of kind of uh, Asian integration or uh, Asian security architecture. Uh, you know, the South China Sea is a China territories. Yeah. And other, other parties have uh, some uh, dispute with China. China already constructed the mechanism with the relevant parties. Uh, for example, the COC. There has been an important progress in the consultation on the uh, code of the conduct of COC in the South China Sea last year. During the China ASEAN summit in the same year, countries agreed on common goal of including the consultation in 2021 or even earlier the final conclusion and the implementation of the COC will secure great stability in the South China Sea, help us manage the differences more effectively, and further promote the mutually beneficial cooperation among all sides. It's, funny, it's very funny, funny uh, uh, stories. I think that maybe a few years ago, American government always persuade China and ASEAN countries to sit together to push forward the COC. But now, Americans now, the saw the, the, the discord, the China and ASEAN countries. I don't know why. All right, thank you. Ambassador Stevens, the, the last word to you in terms of how you see uh, East Asian uh, regional architecture and, and kind of America's role in that, how it, how it fits? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big uh, topic. Uh, you know, I feel as I sit here and, and I really appreciate uh, the chance to uh, have this conversation, you know, we're, we're having a, an important conversation in the middle of a storm. Uh, and it's a storm that's going to pass. And what we're talking about now is going to have an important impact on, I think, what follows. And I don't know what's going to follow. But I do know that, that the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, whatever, um, is going to, I think even more than ever, be the, be the center of, of geopolitical economic strength, I hope, uh, or, or weakness. Our future is there. And from an American perspective, I think that's more apparent than ever, which is not to say that the rest of the world is unimportant, but this is it. So. Um, yeah, we need to keep talking about what that security architecture, economic architecture looks like, what that architecture that allows us to somehow find a way to address problems. I'm not even gonna say common problems, but problems together. I, 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 I agree with Ambassador Oh, I mean, the alternative is, is unthinkable. Uh, we cannot solve them through, through, through military conflict. I am very troubled, as you can tell, by a lot of things. I mean, including, I have to say, by, by increasing authoritarianism and assertiveness in China in ways that I think have, have destabilized and unnerved the region. Uh, I do not think that the US response you know, has been or now is uh, as, as, as wise as, as, and uh, as, as effective as it could be. Uh, so I think the onus is on all of us to try to weather this storm and to think about Right, how we do put into place, whether it's using existing mechanisms and reforming them or expanding others to take into account change realities, including, I would say, a larger role for those who have been quite successful in this. Our middle powers, our mostly dem democracies, including, as, as Kanahara says, some very fragile democracies, um, to bring those voices into what I think is going to be um, you know, a very dangerous period. Uh, that we're going to be in for some time. 
I think that's a good place to end on, but I also want to uh, be optimistic. And in the, mid in the middle of that storm, particularly here in the US, you know, I'm here in New York, the literal epicenter of the pandemic, uh, as we face an election six months away, I, I have to be optimistic, otherwise I will be depressed and I will end this conversation. But my optimism is each of you represent the very best of not only your countries, but your institutions. And to see all the institutions that were brought together today uh, by the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, uh, the Japan Society, and all the other institutions you all represent. Um, thank you for or spending the time with us today, uh, offering your insights. Uh, there are many areas that we could pick up on and continue to have this conversation. Indeed, I hope that uh, even as we move forward, that we will be able to do this together, to bring us all together. Uh, I'm also very mindful that it's almost midnight uh, for our speakers who are still dressed in a suit uh, and should be in their pajamas at this point in time. So I wanna thank them. Uh, I wanna thank our viewers. Uh, thank you so much for this very uh, enlightening conversation. I've learned a lot uh, about what uh, statecraft in the 21st century is gonna look like. There's so many other areas for fruitful conversations that I hope we can have. So thank you all for joining us and thank you the viewers for being with us today. I hope everyone has a good evening and a good morning on this side of the Pacific. Thank you very much.